I'm Dr. Dave Caudel. I am an autism self-advocate, physicist, and the executive director of the Frist Center for Autism and Innovation. And this video is about accommodations for neurodiversity in the workplace. Let me just very briefly define neurodiversity for you. There are many examples of neurodiversity, such as autism, ADHD, dyslexia, Tourette syndrome, and so forth. But basically with neurodiversity, this means that some aspect of this person's operating system, the way their brain works, is wired differently than most people. In a lot of cases, not so much. They're, they're pretty much like everyone else. But in certain circumstances, their brains are working differently enough that they might need accommodations that most people do not need. So there are uh, three things that I'd like to cover in today's video in, in involving accommodations. And the first is the, the concept of accommodations. Now, quick disclaimer, this video is not about legal or ADA requirements. This is not a legal interpretation of what's required. We're just talking about the concept of accommodation. I think a lot of times when we hear the word accommodation, our brains do not go to a good place about that. When we think of accommodations, we're thinking big expensive things, you know, installing ramps and widening access doors and stuff like that. I think some workplaces get a little antsy get a little skittish when they hear about the concept of accommodations. But in a lot of times with neurodiversity, accommodations, particularly from a cost perspective, are not really that big of an ask. All humans need accommodations. It's just when it's the majority, we don't often think of it as accommodations. Take, for example, breaks, where someone takes a break during the day. So in a lot of work environments, there are rules in place so they can go to the restroom if they have to. There are rules in place if they need to take a lunch. Like we understand that humans have biological needs and they need to take these breaks. If you try to make them work for eight to 10 hours straight without giving them a break at all and, and without letting them take care of their biological functions, it can cause all sorts of issues. So this is an accommodation that most workplaces give everyone. We just don't think of it as an accommodation because it's something everybody needs. So yeah, it's just accommodations is not... A bad thing. If somebody needs an accommodation, just think about it from the perspective of we all need accommodations. With these accommodations, this person can be the best version of themselves. And that's that's what we want in the workplace. We want an environment that is healthy and productive enough that the employees can kind of focus on the task at hand and be effective at their jobs. That's what we all want. And so getting someone with special accommodations, the accommodations they need, it's just ensuring that they have the best environment possible for them to do their job, which is what we all want. Second point I want to get to in this video is the track record of companies that have been successful integrating neurodiverse talent. At the Frist Center for Autism and Innovation, we focus on neurodiversity, but we particularly focus on autism. And the reason we do that is because over 80% of people on the autism spectrum are unemployed or underemployed. In a lot of instances, if these folks had the proper accommodations, they'd be absolutely brilliant at their jobs. It's kind of a tragedy for all of us as a society that we have all this tremendous potential kind of going to waste. So that's a lot of our work kind of focuses on that. We work with a lot of companies that are way ahead of the curve in terms of integrating neurodiversity into the workforce. Some of these companies that have been doing it for up to 20 years. And so I'd like to share with you some of the basic takeaways from these companies that do a really good job of successfully integrating neurodiverse talent, particularly autistic talent, into the workplace. An autistic individual such as myself, who is able to speak quite well, uh, one of the biggest struggles that we have in integrating into the workforce is miscommunication. And it seems kind of counter because we seem to be eloquent and we have lots of big words. But the problem is, is that because of our neurodiversity, because our brains are wired differently, than most people. We use language differently than most people. Specifically, we're very literal thinkers. When we hear words, we take the very literal definition of the words. And we have difficulty reading nonverbal communication. We have difficulty understanding the concepts of most people, where they're coming from when they're talking. So we don't get things like sarcasm. So much of human communication is tap dancing around the topic. And that's very difficult for us to understand. In the tap dance, we get lost. What do I mean when I say that? I basically mean we're very blunt and we're very direct in our language. We say precisely what we mean. And when people speak to us, we take the literal definition of the words and phrases that they use, and we try to, we, 
And we think that that's what they're trying to say, is what they're actually literally saying. And so this leads to a lot of miscommunication. We also um, have a hard time understanding how easy it is to other people's feelings. You know, a perfect example I heard is, is recently I heard an employee, she was uh, talking to another employee and the employee had worked really hard on building some sort of software suite that could potentially be helpful for her on her project and said, here, you know, this might be helpful for you. And she looked at it and she couldn't find a way to make it useful. And so she said, this is useless to me. Uh, this was just a, for her, this was just a fact. There was no malice. She wasn't trying to put the person down. She wasn't trying to say, you're useless. She was just trying to say, in this context, this is useless to me. Her colleague got really offended by this and really upset. She did not understand why that person would get upset. That's a perfect example of what I mean with miscommunication. So how does a supervisor overcome that? Well, the supervisors who have been really successful put some thought and effort into their words when they're communicating with their autistic employees. They try to be careful to say precisely what they mean. And they try to avoid things like sarcasm and innuendos. When something seems obvious to them, but their autistic employee seems confused, rather than getting angry that this person's being obstinate or something like that, they, they just stop for a second and go, oh, well, this person's brain works differently than mine. It seems obvious to me, and I think it should be obvious to everyone, but it's not obvious to this person. Let me break it down and try to explain it to them in clear, precise language. That has been a pathway to success for a lot of supervisors and such with autistic employees. It's been a pathway to success uh, because they have an open and frank dialogue back and forth. And when they see their autistic employees being rude to someone else, they kind of step in and say, hey, the way you said that, the phrasing that you use came across as an attack, came across as offensive. That sort of coaching is tremendously valued. Those of us on the autism spectrum who are able to socialize well without stepping on toes, and without upsetting people, have had people in the past come to us and have these frank conversations with us. You have to understand from our perspective, we're just speaking facts and we're using language and, and there's no malice, there's no intent. When I was a child, people used to tell me, you're too brutally honest and you're too blunt. And, and that did not make sense to me because I thought I was just being honest and I was being upright. I thought in our society, being honest is a good thing. I should be celebrated for this. And yet people are angry at me for this. It did not make sense to me because I did not understand. I did not appreciate that people's feelings can be hurt when you're blunt or direct. The reason I had a hard time understanding that is that if you were blunt and direct with me, I did not take offense. We were just simply communicating. And so having people kind of explain that to me is kind of important because alternatively, I just continue to step on people's feelings. In a lot of situations, when someone gets upset in the workplace, they feel like it's obvious that they're upset and their colleagues can turn to them and clearly see that they're upset. So everybody agrees. It's an obvious situation that this person is upset, but an autistic individual or a neurodiverse individual might be in that very same group and may not pick up on the nonverbal cues that are saying this person's upset. So it's obvious to everybody but the autistic person. As far as they can see, everything is fine. Everything is normal. And then everybody gets upset at this person because they're not responding the way the group is. And so what we often do when we see someone behaving in, a, in an odd manner or acting or behaving inappropriately, we often think to ourselves, you know, what would be going through my head? If I was acting like that, what would be my thought patterns? You know, the only way that I could be behaving in such a manner is if I was a monster, if I was a colossal jerk, then I could be acting like that. Therefore, that person must be a monster or that person must be a colossal jerk. And we get angry and we kind of lash out at them. I submit to you, that's a terrible way to handle a situation like that. It is true in life. We do come across people who are jerks and that are intentionally trying to offend one another, we should handle them appropriately in a situation like that. But if you're in an office where you think some of your employees could be autistic or neurodiverse, I submit to you, you shouldn't jump to that conclusion. Have a seed of doubt in your head that, you know, maybe this person's being a colossal jerk, or maybe uh, they don't see things the way I do. And maybe what's obvious to me is not obvious to them. You know, ask some clarifying questions I have a frank, honest discussion with them. Do you, do you realize what you said just now was like highly offensive to everyone and you really hurt this person's feelings? If, if it's an autistic person and they're not aware, they're probably going to say, 
no, that doesn't make any sense to me. They're not trying to discount that they hurt this person's feelings. What they're trying to say is they don't understand how that could hurt someone's feelings. And so that's an, a wonderful opportunity to kind of coach someone and say, well, you should, you should be more careful about that. You should avoid this kind of topic or whatever. You know, have those kinds of conversations with your assisting employees can go a long way in helping reduce those misunderstandings and get everybody on the same page. Being mindful about communication, there are a number of key events where this is particularly important, such as uh, giving feedback, conducting performance evals, hiring and interviewing, socializing, which is to say explain the norms of the organization. It's a misconception that a lot of autistic employees or a lot of autistic individuals don't like to socialize, don't like to interact with people. That's not entirely true. It's not like we don't want to get along with people and we don't want to be a part of the group. That's extraordinarily difficult for us. We often don't know where to start. We've had situations in the past where we started to get along with the group and then suddenly people are yelling at us and we don't understand why. So it makes us skittish, makes us very anxious. You know, ways that you can kind of overcome that is be forgiving, be flexible. Uh, don't be quick to anger. Be patient with these folks and, you know, explain to them the social norms. And hopefully you don't have to actually out someone and say like this person's autistic or something, but you could certainly say uh, this individual kind of struggles with some social norms that a lot of us take for granted. And I, I want you guys to be a little open-minded about that. A good strategy for a workplace is to say, this is a neurodiverse inclusive environment, which is to say, you know, we welcome all types of diversity, including neurodiversity. And if someone's brain works a little bit different than ours. You know, that means they struggle in some ways with things that we don't struggle with, but they also bring strengths. And we welcome all of those strengths. We recognize that we're stronger as a whole, the more diversified our thought processes are. Miscommunication is certainly a huge issue that those of us on the autism spectrum struggle with. But another point that could sometimes need an accommodation is sensory issues. Sometimes we have sensory processing issues. What does that mean? That means that uh, certain types of lights might be too bright, might be very distracting for us. We might have difficulty focusing on the task at hand if there's a lot of conversation going on behind us. The accommodations we might need to be successful in the workplace might be something that address these things. If the lights are too bright for them, then a, a very simple accommodation is allow them to wear shades if they would be comfortable. Make it clear that, that People shouldn't try to pick on or bully someone because they have to wear shades or wear earbuds or some, you know, um, noise canceling headsets or something like that to allow these folks to be the best version of themselves. I, I knew uh, one autistic employee. The accommodation that she asked for in the workplace was they put her desk right next to the water cooler. And a lot of her colleagues would often congregate at the water cooler and chat about a TV show or whatever. And she had difficulty focusing on her work when there were people behind her talking. Uh, she, couldn't, she couldn't tune them out. And so she wasn't able to get her work done while they were having these conversations. So the accommodation she asked for was quite simply, allow me to wear noise-canceling headsets, or please move me somewhere else where I'm not in the middle of all that. This is obviously an accommodation that the supervisor wants to give. This, this is a person who wants to focus on their job, and they want to do a good job. Don't you also want that for them? And so, you know, these accommodations are something that, that benefit all of us in the workplace. So my third and final point for this video, it may be beneficial for you to have a go-to expert. Many organizations uh, have a diversity and inclusive function or an EEO office. These are all usually under HR. If you're a supervisor and, and you're struggling with an employee, maybe there's like a communication issue or they seem to be struggling with something and, and you're trying to think of the best way to help them. HR might be a good place to get started and ask them, you know, especially if you suspect that this person might be neurodiverse, you could reach out to them and say, hey, I have someone, I think they're operating in a slightly different wavelength than everyone else. I think they might be neurodiverse. I'm looking for some tips and tricks, some strategies to kind of help out, uh, help this person be the most successful version of themselves and hopefully have a conversation with somebody there. Now, if they're not familiar with neurodiversity, you're certainly welcome to reach out to us or you're welcome to invite them to reach out to us. You know, this is one of the things we often do at the First Center for Autism and Innovation. And if you'd like to learn more, this is my website. You're welcome to reach out to us. Uh, we have a lot of resources online to kind of help. Mostly they focus on adults on the spectrum in the workplace. 
but we also focus on other neurodiversity. We're happy to have a virtual chat with you or a conversation. In fact, it's in the last couple of years, this is something that's kind of built up more and more. I, I have supervisors reach out to me and, and they talk about how a specific employee they have, they notice some signs that this person might be neurodiverse and they're having difficulty getting through to them. So we have a conversation. I explain to them some strategies that might be helpful for that. And, and so far, that's, that seems to have been pretty helpful. We've had a lot of productive conversations that way. We're always happy to do that. If you're watching this video and you have uh, an employee that you think might be neurodiverse, you're struggling with the best way to kind of help them get through that issue, by all means, please feel free to reach out to us. We'd be happy to talk to you and see if there's something we could do to help or get you in contact with some resources that might be helpful.